So where have I been? That's the question you might be wondering. Why no videos in so long? Well, let me tell you. Darkness took me and I strayed out of thought and time. Stars wheeled overhead, and every day was as long as the life age of the Earth. But it was not the end. I felt life in me again. I have been sent back until my task is done. What task is that? Finishing the Wheel of Time series this year. <laughs> what it really was is I just had a bit of a reading slump which led to a bit of creative slump therefore not reading any books not making any book reviews not uploading any videos however I have decided to make more of an effort to upload and get back into a more frequent schedule and so I am beginning with this a review for Wheel of Time book for the Shadow Rising what better way to launch back into this than reviewing the book in the series that I have challenged myself to get through the entirety of this year and I am I am behind in that challenge so yes the Shadow Rising is the fourth book in the Wheel of Time series. This should go without saying, but this video will be, you know, spoilers for books 1 to 3 for the Wheel of Time, and while I'm going to try and keep it spoiler free for The Shadow Rising, I am going to be talking about the plot of what happens in this book in broad strokes. So bear that in mind if you are still to read The Shadow Rising and you want to go in completely fresh. But as I say, I'm not going to be spoiling any major elements or twists of the book, I'm just going to be talking in broad strokes about what the plot is and what the various characters are up to. Now, I just finished reading this book this morning, like half an hour before recording this, so it is quite fresh in my mind. As with the previous instalment, there were parts I like and parts I didn't. Contrary to my opinion on The Dragon Reborn, the previous book, where I thought Nynaeve and Egwene and Elaine's parts of the book were some of the absolute highlights, their storyline in this one felt very uh, lackluster. That was the storyline in this book where I got to it and I was like, ah, oh, this again. It seems to be like in each book now there's gonna be at least one storyline that I'm just not that invested in. That's what appears to be happening. And again, I wasn't super invested in the Perrin storyline for the last book, however the Perrin storyline in this book I thoroughly enjoyed. Perrin going back to the two rivers, rallying them together against the Children of the Light and the Trollocs who have begun to come down on the two rivers and getting to meet some of the Evansfield characters again and getting to see them interact with Perrin and see how much Perrin has grown from when he first leaves the two rivers in the first book. All of that stuff uh, and his relationship with Fael continuing really, really great. I really enjoyed Perrin's chapters in this book. That being said, there was a frustrating element to both of those storylines, the Perrin storyline and the, um, the Nynaeve storyline, and that is the stubbornness of some of these characters. Especially right at the start, both Perrin and Fael and, <laughs> and Nynaeve, they're all just very stubborn characters and it is to their detriment in some parts of the book and it's just very frustrating to read, especially Perrin and Fael. If you, if you just, if either one of you, or ideally both of you, would just swallow your pride for a minute, we could we could get on with this. And you know, it was upsetting Loyal, and you, you can't be upsetting Loyal. Loyal's too good, too pure for this world. Anything that's upsetting Loyal is upsetting me. <laughs> the, I'm Loyal number one stan over here. Something that gets introduced quite early on is uh, these pockets of evil. Without going too deep into spoilers for what that means, they're elements of the Dark One's power that are b breaking into the world uh, and attacking Rand and Matt and Perrin. That gets set up quite early on as like something that's gonna be very dangerous, but it only really comes back once or twice in the entirety of the book, and in a near 1,000 book page book, hang on, and in a near 1,000 page book you would expect it to be a bit more frequent, it just kind of feels like this thing gets introduced and then gets done away with, comes back once, maybe twice, but it just, it isn't as prevalent as sort of its introduction leads us to believe. I would have liked a bit more of that. Maybe we'll get more of it in the next couple of books. I hope so, because it's a cool element and it's a cool part of the threat of the Dark One that our main characters have to face. So it felt like a kind of underwhelming payoff to what was quite a, a high setup. Speaking of Rand and Matt, especially Matt, Matt once more continues to rise his way up the ranks of my favourite characters. In fact, in this book, uh, I would say he was the best character, overtaking Loyal just because Loyal didn't have as big a role uh, in this book as he's had in some of the previous ones. Matt is fantastic. I'm thoroughly enjoying the way his character arc and his storyline is progressing now that he's free of the dagger and he's got his whole luck magic powers to contend with. Big fan of just his continued sarcasm and, and very much not wanting to be here but having to be here attitude. I'm especially glad that he goes with Rand and they stick together because Rand 
is a fine character, but some of his parts felt just kind of dry. No pun intended, because they're in the Aiel Waste, which is a dry desert place. But, I don't know, something about Rand in this book just wasn't as compelling. I did like the way that he is trying to break free of uh, Moiraine's control and try and keep all of his plans to himself. It adds a nice little bit of mystery as to, oh, well, what, well, what is Rand planning? Because even in his own POV chapters, we don't really get to understand what it is he's doing. We just know that he has a plan in place and he can't have anyone find it out. And that was definitely a, a nice bit of intrigue that sort of kept me invested in what was going on with Rand. But as for his actual personality, he has become somewhat less of a compelling character than than the other characters in the series. Another highlight of this book is is a, a bit more unfolding of the of the world building of this overall series, which is something that I'm really looking forward to digging deeper into as the series goes on. And there's some things that I happen to already know about the world building of the Wheel of Time, which I don't know how big the reveal of it will be, if it'll be like a big reveal or like a gradual uncovering, but I am really looking forward to how it integrates with the with the story that we're following and how that fact about the world will play into the the world as it is now. I love talking about things without trying to spoil it, just like vague generalities everywhere. The point is, learning more about the world building in this book specifically was very very fun and I enjoyed that aspect of it a lot. As well as getting to learn more about the Aiel culture and getting to spend more time with them, especially when they get annoyed at like Rand and Matt and, and Egwene when they bring up their customs in the, in the wetland and then the Aiel just don't understand it at all and then they don't understand the Aiel. It's a, it's a fun, it's a fun, it's a fun little cultural exchange trip. That was the uh, unused title for this book, The Wheel of Time Book 4, Fun Little Cultural Exchange Trip. Another big positive for this book is uh, a character who Nynaeve and Elaine meet, who again is a character who's hard to talk about without spoiling too much. I really didn't think through <laughs> the list of the things I was gonna say about this book, I'm really just spinning my wheels here. Wheels of, wheels of time. Uh, it all, it all comes together. Nynaeve and Elaine meet a character who has ties to a group of characters who were, have previously been antagonistic. I thought that was a very interesting character and I like the dynamic between her and Elaine and Nynaeve and I'm looking forward to seeing how that progresses in the future books as well. I think that's added an interesting wrinkle into like the, the dynamics of all the major groups that are at play in the, in the entirety of the story. Something that I wasn't so keen on is something that I feel is not so much a problem with this book as it is with the series overall, but at this point it has begun to feel a little bit repetitive in that the book starts out, the, the main characters are at a location, and then they get attacked by Trollocs and they have to go somewhere else. They have a big old journey to a different location and then they get attacked by one of the Forsaken and there's a big old battle and then someone has a big revelation and then we'll, we'll start the next book in that location and then they'll get attacked by Trollocs and have to move to somewhere else. And while I do enjoy the, the Trolloc attack scenes, the repetitive nature of them has become a little bit tiring at this point. We're four books in. Is every book going to have the same sort of formula? I hope not, but I'm not holding my breath that it, that it won't. It's similar to like the, the, the Walking Dead problem. It was always like, they're in a safe location. The location becomes unsafe. They've got to get to a new safe location. Ooh, wonder what's gonna happen there. Something that happened, uh, speaking of the Trolloc attacks, something that happened that I really enjoyed is we're getting like slight hints that not all of the Trollocs are working together. There appears to be dividing factions within the ranks of the Trollocs and the Murdral and the and the Shadow Spawn because in one of the early attacks, some of the characters get saved from Trollocs by other Trollocs. That is a very interesting aspect to it all, which uh, it isn't developed on too much in this book, but I hope it gets developed on further down the line because I am interested in what that might portend for, like, the rest of the series, if not all of the Trollocs and the Murdral are necessarily on the blanket the same side. I wonder if maybe it's that like, some of them are tied to particular members of the Forsaken? Speaking, speaking of which, I feel like the threat of the Forsaken has dwindled dramatically from when they're introduced in the first book. At this point, it's just like, they're still obviously powerful entities within this world, but a lot of the main characters now are also powerful enough to match them. They feel like less of a big threat and more just kind of, oh, these guys again. Like, just an annoyance at this point. <laughs> Which is a shame, because I feel like the amount of threat and the persistence of the threat is some is one of my, still one of my favourite aspects of the first book. It's what made me like that book so much, is that the threat felt so real and hot on the heels of our main characters. But at this point, a lot of our main characters have grown 
grown in, in power and character and the, the threat of the Dark Ones and the and the Shadow Spawn just doesn't feel quite as prominent as it once did. Which to me lets down the sort of like the grippingness factor of, of the books. But then again, we've not met all of the Forsaken yet, so maybe there's some more powerful ones out there that we are still to be introduced to. So we'll see what happens. The wheel weaves as the wheel wills. So weighing it all up, and bear in mind I just finished reading this book this morning, so my opinion on this could change, but I do feel like my immediate reaction is to say this is one of the this has been one of the weaker installments in the series so far. However, there were big shining lights in it, particularly Perrin's storyline in the two rivers. That was the storyline that I was most looking forward to getting back to each time. I think that's absolutely the best part uh, of this. And I think that's, that's pretty much the, my thoughts on, on the Shadow Rising. Some good stuff in there, particularly the Perrin storyline, but the especially the, the biggest downside of this book for me was the sort of the feeling of a, a repetitive formula beginning to take shape in, in that whole safe place Walking Dead scenario that I was talking about. Yeah, that is my, that's my opinion on book four of The Wheel of Time, The Shadow Rising. If you too have read The Shadow Rising, let me know what your thoughts are in the comments down below. If you agree or disagree with any of the things I said, drop it below, let me know. If you like this video, please do give it a big thumbs up. That'd be very, very nice of you, and I'd be, I'd be grateful for it. You could also subscribe to the channel if you want to see more. I will keep doing these Wheel of Time reviews as, until I finish The Wheel of Time. Hopefully within the year, or... <laughs> We'll see. We'll see what happens on that front. The, the wheel wheels the wheel wheels, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna try though. Thank you all so much for watching this video, and as always, I'll see you in my next one. First of all, darkness took me.